I'm really grateful to have had those, I guess, markers of success because I think they are something that I look at when I am feeling like I need something to, you know, feel as though my goals are being met. But at the same time, I think if I didn't have those things at all, I would still need the motivation to keep going, if that makes sense. Like there, there are these things that I really am grateful and appreciative of having. And yet, if I ever found myself in a position where I was only relying on that to justify my career moving forward, I think I would lose my mind completely. Um, because at the end of the day, like those markers are these kinds of goalposts that we either set for ourselves to have something to look forward to, or that larger industry people set in order to like give a little ribbon of achievement. Um, so, you know, it's like, of course, I really, really feel good to have these things, but I think I still need to have like several come to Jesus moments, like every few months being like, am I relying too heavily on like exterior validation points to be inspired? And if so, how do I reconfigure that to like find my love for writing again or find what originally inspired me to tell stories just for the sake of it? What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 87 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewie to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hi, I am doing wonderful. How are you, Adrian? Doing very well. And uh, I'm just going to spend a little moment to uh, promote MJ's work because she's the best and it's a new year and she needs money to feed her cat. So go buy Among <laughs> Thieves, this hot, hot book right here and its sequel, Thick Ass Thieves, to start the new <laughs> year. Get yourself a double dose of heists and all kinds of fun adventure as well. You can stay tuned tomorrow. We're recording in the past, but tomorrow when this episode goes live, my cover reveal for Mushroom Blues will be going live. So uh, January 17th, you can catch that on my social media, on Fanfy Addict, on Before We Go blog, a bunch of different places. So stay tuned. On MJ's social media. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just going to share it. She's going to share it, of course. Hell yeah, if I am. <laughs> don't, then I'll spite you. <laughs> but yeah, stay tuned for that on January 17th. Uh, and I hope you like the amazing uh, artwork of Felix Ortiz. So stay tuned for that. As well, a quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app, and subscribe to the Fanfatic YouTube channel, where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. Also, a quick shout out to our first new patrons of 2024, Davis Tran and David Mitchell, although not the novelist, nor the British comedian, but still a really awesome guy, and he's always on Twitter supporting our, so, our show, so thank you, David, and thank you, Davis. And now, welcoming today's guest, Chloe Gong, best-selling author of These Violent Delights, Our Violent Ends, Immortal Longings, and more, including her latest release, Foul Heart Huntsman. Welcome to SFF Addicts. Chloe, how are you? I'm good. How are you both? Doing very well. Very excited today. <laughs> I love uh, feeding cats is the reason why we need royalties. Like, no other reason. Like 100%. Yeah. Thorn is a hungry boy. He's a hungry boy. boy. He demands He's the best in food boy. and treats. <laughs> He's needy, man. He needs your books to like knock over and shit. And then he needs food to stay alive. <laughs> all any cat needs for happiness. <laughs> That's all he needs. I just need some stuff to knock over and some, some eats. Before we dig deeper into the episode, a quick word from our sponsor. Novello is an exciting new publishing and reading platform whose goal is to be the go-to for all things writing and storytelling. Their platform offers an intuitive, user-friendly way for writers to create and share their awesome stories for readers to enjoy, all while maintaining total control over their stories. Everything from the content to cover art and pricing is all controlled by the story's author. 
Novello also offers social features such as message boards, direct messaging, and a news feed where you can post updates to your followers. With future plans including support for comics and a marketplace for users to sell other writing-related services, the future of this platform is looking bright. And the best part? It's all available for free. No sign-up fees, no membership, just a growing library of epic tales. Sign up now to bask in the magic of books, where you can enjoy tales like Blackwater, an epic adventure by an award-winning author, or Limbo, the door above the lake, a terrifying battle for survival. Whether you're a casual reader or a professional writer, Novello is the place for you. Visit them at novello.com. That's N-O-V-E-L-O dot com. And now, enjoy the rest of this episode of SFF Addicts. All right, Chloe. So um, let's start off with an introduction for listeners who aren't familiar with you. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Absolutely. So hello, all who have tuned in. My name is Chloe Gong. I am the author of These Violent Lights, Our Violent Ends, Foul Lady Fortune, and Foul Her Huntsman on the YA side. And on the adult side, my debut, Immortal Longings, came out this year. It's the first in a trilogy uh, based on Antony and Cleopatra, because I've been doing a lot of, um, you know, Shakespearean-inspired retellings. So that's my brand as of right now, but I am hoping to write some, you know, futuristic speculative things in the Y space Ooh. soon as well. So I am very much an SFF addict. So happy to be here. Perfect. You're the first <laughs> guest I've ever had who's said Who said it? Yeah. It's like, I hope that one's me extra points. Yeah. It does. It no, does. you've already gotten extra points for being so damn cool, but damn. <laughs> It's like when you watch yeah. a movie and they say the title of the movie in the movie, mm -hmm. that just happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except Titanic, because it's about the well that, that just happened yeah, all the time. That doesn't count. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, speaking of being an SFF addict, um, we mm -hmm. we always like to ask about our guests' history, reading, and engaging with fantasy and science fiction, because we're all big nerds and we like to talk about cool nerdy stuff. So, mm -hmm. do you remember the first fantasy or sci-fi media that? really captured you and made you go like, yeah, this is my shit. I do. Um, so I grew up with the YA paranormal boom, uh, which means the first franchise that I was like a mega fan of was Cassandra Clare's The Mortal Instruments. Um, I ran a, I ran a Tumblr for that series. <laughs> I, I can admit it now. I have admitted it to Cassie's face. So I think now I can be telling. No, you can be open. Is it, still, is it still up? Can people go and visit it still? No, I changed the URL, so <laughs> it's not there anymore. Like I corrupted it. it from the internet. <laughs> I didn't need to hide it because it was basically like thirteen-year-old me uh, reblogging gifts of Jamie Campbell Bower, who played Jace Herondale in the movie adaptation. It was dire. It was really dire. Um, <laughs> But that was the first series that I was a – I was a fan of the entire world, not just what was on the pages, if that makes sense. It was the first franchise I really obsessed over in the sense that when I just had free time, I would vividly imagine what the characters were up to and what new adventures they were getting up to. So that was – it was where my love for, you know, big expansive worlds came from. That's so awesome. I love I love that you had a Tumblr. It's like whenever whenever guests tell us about like fan fiction and stuff like that, there's like there's like a hint of pride mixed in with the, the embarrassment. <laughs> and it just makes me Because it's it so makes me really many happy of us, that. right? Like <laughs> like I said, we're all just big nerds that grew up to yeah. be yeah. bigger nerds. <laughs> yeah. 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 I used to pride draw like fan fiction comics and like that was my jam. <laughs> yeah. Never yeah. had a Tumblr. But. <laughs> <laughs> I had binders. I had binders. You had binders? Oh, my Tumblr, <laughs> my like Tumblr got Trump, really I had fun. binders. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't Trump. No, Some that American was Romney. Come on, learn That's your American politics. <laughs> I'm Canadian. You're Canadian that lives in care. Ecuador. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Chloe, so you started with the Tumblr. You <laughs> told Claire to her face that you, that you had this Tumblr and everything like that, but between then, let's hear mm. a bit more about your writing journey and path toward publication in terms of like, um, how did you get started writing? 
and and that how did that progress? But what have been some of the mm-hmm. most rewarding parts of that that journey, and and what were some of the hardest parts Ooh. of it? So I started writing very very early. So the time span between me like stopping posting on that Tumblr and me becoming a professional author is actually very, very, very small. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was writing all throughout my teenage years when I was keeping that Tumblr, when I was a really, really big, I guess, YA and general, you know, SFF reader. Um, I kind of started writing because I was a really fast reader and I would finish reading all the books that I had gone from the library that week and in, or, in order to fill that hole of escapism I needed, I would just write my own books. And I never thought of it as writing a serious novel. I would always call it writing my little stories because there was nothing really that original about it. Like, yes, it was original fiction, but I would essentially rip off the plot of whatever favorite series I had at the time. Um And I would write up that first draft and kind of just toss it aside. And I did that for years and years and years, just storytelling for the sake of it. And sometimes now in like author life, I kind of miss doing that because I didn't, I guess, stop doing that until I wrote These Violent Delights, which would then become my debut. Like These Violent Delights was the first book that I actually went back to revise in a serious way in order to make it better. And it is so clear, obviously, that revision makes your craft better. You know, writing is actually in the rewriting of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I had a lot of fun back when I would write a book and just toss it aside and never look at it again. So, you know, different processes for different needs. Do you think it was challenging to get into revision and like approaching that for the first time? Oh, for sure. I definitely had a steep learning curve when it came to that because I was so used to just writing um, for the fun of it. And I almost had to teach myself to write with the aim of publication. And it was very different uh, compared to writing for the aim of entertainment. I had to actually think about like, what about this needs to make sense as opposed to what about this is the most fun for me to do once and not really look at again. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah, it was just like I can I can just toss it aside afterwards and not really have to think about it anymore. <laughs> right, well, it's the difference between writing as a hobby, right, versus writing with the goal of at least publication, if mm. not a career, mm-hmm. um, which sure. they are totally different. In a they kind are. of related vibe, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about success because, like, uh, I think it's pretty much indisputable. You're you're quite successful. <laughs> Um, you're a number one New York Times bestselling author. Um, you're on 2024's Forbes 30 under 30. Like, holy shit, girl. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about those things. Like, what do those achievements mean to your mm-hmm. personal sense of your tra- or your trajectory of your career and what success means to you? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm really grateful to have had those, I guess, markers of success because I think they are something that I look at when I am feeling like I need something to you know feel as though my goals are being met but at the same time I think if I didn't have those things at all I would still need the motivation to keep going if that makes sense like that there are these things that I really am grateful and appreciative of having and yet If I ever found myself in a position where I was only relying on that to justify my career moving forward, I think I would lose my mind completely. Um, Because at the end of the day, like those markers are these kinds of goalposts that we either set for ourselves to have something to look forward to, or that larger industry people set in order to like give a little ribbon of achievement. Um, So, you know, it's like, of course, I really, really feel good to have these things but I think I still need to have like several come to Jesus moments like every few months being like am I relying too heavily on like exterior validation points to be inspired and if so how do I reconfigure that to like find my love for writing again or find what originally inspired me to tell stories just for the sake of it. Um, Cause I think it's so easy to get caught up in those kinds of goalposts and I'm definitely guilty of it, but 
I think as long as I keep snapping my fingers at myself every so often, I'm like, actually, these things are very shiny and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And yes, I do like putting it in my bio. However, it cannot only be about yeah, that. Like you can't sustain yourself or mm-hmm. your creativity or your career on those things. Cause MJ and I have talked Absolutely. about like in the past, this sort of notion of moving goalposts yeah. and, and they'll mm-hmm. always whether- move. They'll always move. And and yeah. and for some people, it can kind of be overwhelming the sense that like you're never mm-hmm. satisfied with these things. Mm-hmm. And the what you said about uh sort of like the publishing industry, I'm just imagining them get, like handing out like here's a participation ribbon. <laughs> right. I hope you're fucking satisfied. Just pinning like, them on our shirts. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the thing, right? The publishing industry absolutely hands out participation yeah. ribbons. They're like, look, here's your marketing plan. And you're like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Or like, here's like your marketing plan. You're like, this isn't what I expected. (laughs) (laughs) Two pennies. (laughs) Nothing. The fuck? Oh, man. But I think another thing about you that's really uh, impressionable is the fact that like, you know, not only are you making a successful career in this industry, but you're also making a a successful career as a woman in an industry that is predominantly has been for a long time, very male centric, very white centric. Mm -hmm. And mm. just the fact that it's so it's changing so rapidly. Um, what career advice would you give to like young writers out there listening mm. or watching in terms of like mm. things to think about um, and ways of approaching this industry uh, as it's sort of in this weird limbo space between the antiquated past and the the mysteries of of whatever future it holds. Mm -hmm. I feel like the thing about giving advice is that I feel like I have so much advice. And on the flip side, I also feel like so much advice oftentimes is like inapplicable depending on who you are, right? Because so often what works for one person might not work for another person or what works for one person is the complete opposite to someone else. So I feel like the best advice is always that you as an author will always know what is best for you best, if that makes sense. Um, Because especially when you are marginalized in some way, like if you are the minority in the room, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, there will oftentimes be systems that have been built on people and perspectives that are very different to yours. It could be the way that you approach the industry, or it could be the way you approach a story on a craft level. Um, But they are rules that have been made by people who have been around longer, having a different worldview and having a, you know, certain privilege in a way that you might not be the same, like receptive to. Um, So whether it is, you know, querying an industry like whether you don't necessarily need to follow certain rules that other people have set because what your story demands and the way you pitch it is different or if it's even the way you tell the story like if your writing techniques are different you always know yourself best and that's not to say like don't take anyone's advice ever it's more that I think anytime you are not the majority you have to be aware that sometimes majority advice isn't for you, which is very, it's, it's kind of meta to give advice about being careful what advice you take. <laughs> but I, I wish someone had told me that. Cause I think when I was first starting out in the industry, I tried so hard to either follow every rule people were setting, or I drove myself nuts trying to make sure everyone was pleased. And you can't do that because then you are either, you know, it, either it was never suited for you anyway or you have sacrificed your own art in order to follow a mold that is, it, it was made for other people all along. Um, I hope that made sense for anyone listening. Yeah. Well, to me, it made sense. <laughs> Absolutely. I MJ probably did too. But like, not, on top of that, it's like, not only are there individuals and it's like, you may be in a room of people, but those people are shaped by the, the sort of perspectives of institutions. And it's kind of like, Uh, especially in trad pub, like the institutions themselves have sort of like antiquated systems and judgmental Mm -hmm. systems built into them inherently just by the fact it's like, it's been around since like 1970. This is how we've always Mm -hmm. done it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I feel like publishing is one of those industries that, um, on the grander scale, on the corporate scale is much, 
much more resistant to change and the changes mm-hmm, happen much more slowly. And I think it's really cool that like for you and I think a lot of other authors out there, the change that happens is probably being made on the individual author level because they're the ones who are pushing against the system. They're the ones who are setting new trends that kind of break the expectations of those publishers. And they think like, oh shit, this thing could make us more money. And obviously that's not mm-hmm. always the best thing because um, chasing trends can sometimes uh, lead to disappointments. But at the same time, it is really cool that the author's even if they're from a minority group, even if they're from a gender that is usually suppressed within this industry, that they have the ability to kind of like push the buttons and be like, draw Mm -hmm. attention to certain things that might need a little bit more flexibility or change. I feel like that's why it's also so important to have like community among people who either are aiming for the same things as you are, or are in some way experiencing it similarly. Cause you can like temp check with them. You can be like, am I going nuts or is this thing actually not doing what they think they're doing and I should say something? And then they're like, yeah, you should say something. And then that's the only way you can make change in a very old industry. Absolutely. Temp, temp well, check is a good term for that. It's like yeah. MJ. Sanity check though. Check my temp things are, make sure shit's not crazy. Yeah, sanity yeah, check too. Things are so exactly. opaque in the industry. Mm-hmm. And I completely agree mm-hmm. with you. Community is so essential because it's the only way. Mm-hmm. It's the only way you're going to know. And whether, authors you know, generally are like some – not every case is very much a generalization, but authors are often the only people who understand other authors because we're, you know, <laughs> yes. we're, we're all, all the same special. kind of crazy. We're yeah. all <laughs> we're all yeah. nice. Yes, in the best way, I think. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, let's dig into your work, Chloe. I'm really excited to talk about um, about your books. Um, so <laughs> as you kind of alluded to a little earlier in the episode, um, a lot of your work kind of remixes Shakespeare in very creative ways. Um, so I have a two part question here. First off, why Shakespeare? And second, what inspires you or initially inspired you maybe to reinvent and remix those classic stories? Mm, okay, so to kind of approach the two parter at the same time, I initially kind of stumbled on to remixing Shakespeare. Because when I was, I guess, like, conceptualizing these violent delights which was my first published book um i had come up with the elevator pitch first about rival gang families with a blood feud and i thought oh my goodness i'm gonna pitch this to literally anyone in the world and they're gonna say oh like romeo and juliet (laughs) like there was just no going around that whatsoever because the elevator pitch was literally two star-crossed lovers from opposing <laughs> families. There's just, there was just no way. Um, but, you know, I really enjoyed Shakespeare in high school. And as I was approaching college, I was um, an aspiring English major. So I've always liked this idea of, like, how do we turn the old new? And how do we, you know, not shed old ideas entirely but take what is useful with a very modernized and relevant lens and retellings are something that's always been very fascinating to me because I I love reading retellings like in my reader life there are some uh book series as I was growing up where the most fascinating thing to me was that they took a very very old story and somehow surprised me with the way they did it um So I thought, okay, I'm going to do a Romeo and Juliet retelling because I think that has something interesting to it where people aren't going to say, oh, you're just doing again. I'm like very openly remixing it, but with a new lens onto it, which should hopefully bring uh, new perspectives onto it. Once I did Romeo and Juliet for these Valentine's Delights, I kind of just found myself in the Shakespeare niche accidentally, which... You know, I wasn't opposed to, again, I do, I am a Shakespeare enjoyer. I am an English major after all. Uh, So I ended up going into As You Like It for the spinoff Valley Fortune because by coincidence, one of the characters was already named Rosalind. And I looked at As You Like It and I thought, oh my God. Shakespeare did this for me 400 years ago. It's fate. It really was. It felt like fate because As You Like It is this play about identity and hiding things and like complicated families. And that was exactly what I wanted to do when I was going to do a spinoff in this universe. Um, 
So that's how I then landed in like that arena. And then going into like my adult fantasy series, which is based off of Antony and Cleopatra, one of my uh, favorite readings in a Shakespeare class I took in college was comparing Romeo and Juliet to Antony and Cleopatra, wherein they are both the star-crossed lovers archetype, but Romeo and Juliet is so quintessentially about youth because it's about the adults in their lives letting them down. It's about external circumstances that are holding them apart, whereas Antony and Cleopatra is so much a story about adults. Like This could only work if they were fully grown, in charge of their own actions, and the reason why they are opposed is because they both want power more than they want each other and I thought oh my god it would just be so great if I did my adult debut as an Anthony and Cleopatra telling because then my works are in conversation with each other in the same way that Shakespeare's plays are in conversation with each other um so I very much was inspired to do that because I am a nerd and I really like the idea of an English major like 10 years in the future like looking at my entire list of works and writing a thesis about it so that was my inspiration there getting I love so, it you're getting so meta man like <laughs> exactly <laughs> <That's> right, yeah <laughs> okay serious question have you I mean obviously you've seen it but the 90s Romeo and Juliet movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio that's my favorite that version that was like yeah, when you're talking about names. remixing I'm like Mm -hmm. that that movie is like everything everything about it is like i read mm. somewhere that that movie despite how different it is in setting is the most faithful line by line romeo and juliet adaptation. no because they, they, yeah. they straight up pull lines and they yeah. do you remember the fact that they're like um they're these like california kind of like gangsters but they're mm -hmm. they're reciting lines as if they were living in shakespeare's time yes and how they, yes. that was kind of this like weird jarring experience but I think it kind I of played really into like the atmosphere of that movie so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just like, yeah, yeah. The, oh my God. I'm just having flashbacks to how fucking great that movie is. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is definitely my favorite adaptation. Like just the, I mean, Baz Luhrmann is incredible mm -hmm. at aesthetic and making it mean something. So it's, Oh, I need to rewatch that actually. Now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> and the great Gatsby too. That was another great Buzz oh, yeah. movie. I love the Great yeah. Gatsby. Because it's like yeah. seeing, yeah, like seeing those movies is kind of like like reading your books because there's this really like um That is the nicest thing you could ever say to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're an SFF addict. I'm just gonna charm the shit out of you. <laughs> um there's something about your books that is very aesthetic driven, which I think is something that Boz Lerman really nails in his movies in terms of like set design is just ridiculously good costumes are on point and with your books obviously we're in a in the textual medium so it's a bit different but the way that you use description and then the way that you use characters and the way that you use setting are very evocative of atmosphere and aesthetics and for me like the coolest thing is this like secret shanghai kind of um world that you've created and I wanted to get your opinions on like how it feels for you to be able to like highlight and represent China and the city of Shanghai in this sort of like SFF space, but also introduce fantasy readers to a, to a historical time period that they might not be familiar with. And for me, it's like, I love, um, sort of like the interwar period between world war one and world war two. And my book is, inspired a lot by Japan. So it's like, I've, I've read mm -hmm. a lot about it and researched a lot in the ways in which Japan interacted with China and the way that mm -hmm. China's culture sort of evolved during that time. That was very like tumultuous and very weird. And it was like this crazy identity crisis for that nation. Mm -hmm. But you just like drop these Romeo, these Shakespeare remixes into this setting, which for most people would be like, what the fuck? but you pull it <laughs> off. Like you really fucking pull it off. So I want to get your opinion on all that. Well, thank you for saying that. I, the joke that I always make is that people go into my books expecting like, you know, either the enemies to lovers or the marriage of convenience or the fake marriage. And then they learn a lot more about the Chinese civil war than they expected. Yeah. That is always my gotcha <laughs> moment. History um, lessons, deal with it. Exactly. <laughs> Guys. Um, 
I just, I love how many readers that I've accidentally given like hyper fixations to, like they finish the series and they're like, actually, I need to know more about the warlord yeah. period in China. It's like, what the hell happened to Manchuria? Yeah. What's going on here? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I really wanted to go in very intentionally about both having the aesthetic and the politics. Um, because as I mentioned, I love The Great Gatsby. I also love The Twenties. But I had been reading a lot of books um, before I wrote These Violent Delights that took the Roaring Twenties and did not portray any of the darkness of the era, which to me felt incredibly empty because so much of what is glittering about the 1920s is that contrast between the suffering going on at that time that was able to give this like explosion of capitalism um and then you either look at you know portrayals of the roaring 20s either in the u.s or you look at potentially like portrayals of the era like in shanghai and it was just never quite the angle that i was interested in seeing right like either it's the roaring 20s and the aesthetic or it was just these perspectives from like the british detective that went into shanghai and then solved mysteries and i was like well what about the locals like what were they thinking and at the same time because i write in english and i read in english i couldn't really access like you know chinese fiction either it just wasn't made for me um, and so there was kind of a niche there where I was like, if I want to read this, I'm sure there are other people out there who want to read this as well. And I just want to take a perspective where we are looking at how beautiful the costumes are and how this was a decade where the visuals were beautiful, right? This is something that is very interesting to see. At the same time, those visuals did not exist without the colonialism that like swept in. It did not exist without the opium wars that had just happened in order to divide the city for the foreigners to rule. And that caused the gangsters to be able to rise to prominence. Um, so I really wanted to go in with this uh, equal weight on both aspects. And I knew the aesthetics was going to possibly be able to draw a mainstream audience in, you know, when you pitch it as like Romeo and Juliet in 1820 Shanghai, I was hopeful that had enough of like a, like a net, the gotcha, yeah. right? I was like, okay, you guys can come in for this Something elevated really pitch. And then I was like, man. yeah, I was like, joke's on you. Now we're talking about imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I I really did hope that, you know, even if that wasn't what readers thought they would expect, that is something they would understand is very inseparable from that time period. And, you know, in order to tell the story as it should be, it had to address these things. Yeah. Actually reading your work, there's one book that came to sort of like has always crept back into my mind because it's, it's set in the UK. Um, mm. but it is a representation of the sort of like, uh, aftermath and chaos. And I would say like, cultural and psychological destruction that happens when something like uh the great war or the opium wars or what have mm. you and it's mrs dalloway by virginia wolf have you read okay. have you read that before okay mm. i think you're gonna like it because it's basically about okay. it's like super quaint in the fact that it's set in this mm. like british household but it's uh -huh. all about conversations and it's all about the fact mm. that so many of these people are suffering from like PTSD mm -hmm. at that point they called it mm -hmm. shell shock they're suffering from mm -hmm. like identity crises they're suffering from just like a sort of um disintegration of what their society mm -hmm. once was and the fact that they're unable to sort of comprehend what it is and what it might become and that's mm -hmm. like exactly the period that you've kind of set your stories in mm -hmm. in, in Shanghai where it's like you have like literal neighborhoods called the French concession. And it's like this, this city is divided and the people are divided, but it also kind of like divides the mind as much as it does physical space. Mm -mm -mm. Absolutely. It was called Mrs. Dalloway. Yeah, you said Virginia Wolf. Okay. Noted. as an English major, like, I think you're going to love it. Yeah. I was going to say, you're going to love it. I, I had to read it in high school. So I do remember it for that. But <laughs> back at that time when you're like, I hated the fact that I had that's to what I was going to say. I haven't read it as an adult where I might actually enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember reading it as like a bitter 16 year old, but yeah. where everything <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like anything they assign you, you're just like piss off. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what to read. <laughs> 
Well, let's talk magic a little bit. Um, let's mm -hmm. get a little magical in here. Um, because I find your magic systems fascinating, super inventive. Um, so I want to talk about how you build them, how you come up with them. So, like, for example, like what gave you the idea of the whole body doubling element that's really fascinating in immortal longings? Um, and if you can talk about like the the process by which you build them, right? Like, do you plot it out? Do you uh, how does it work for you? <laughs> mm -hmm. This is the perfect podcast to talk about this because I constantly have like science fiction edge like archetypes I want to work in and then I just slam it into the fantasy genre so there are always these moments where people are reading my books and they're like I don't know where to shelve this and I'm like yeah sorry about that <laughs> um <laughs> it's kind of the same as like my YA series like they're technically classified as YA fantasy mm -hmm. and yet if you actually look at the plot like these violence lights is YA science fiction historical and then Fat Lady Fortune is like why a science fiction historical thriller. It's yeah, it's, it's, like, it's almost like a like a like a spy thriller. Mixed it is. It, it yeah. really is. Um, yeah. So with Immortal Longings, um, I was kind of working with this general idea that I was. I have been mulling about this for many years now, where I am very fascinated by the fantasy genre and its insistence on speaking about monarchy by replacing a bad king with a quote unquote good king. And every time I'm looking at history and especially Chinese history that has gone through, you know, centuries and centuries of different um, dynasties, that never works. There's no such thing as a good king. There's kind of a temporary fair king maybe, but so long as that system exists and until the system is overthrown, Nothing really changes. And then one could argue because of the thousands of years of dynasties, even that system will keep corrupting over time, which is a really long winded way of saying, I was just fascinated by why the fantasy genre was so insistent on doing that. And I, I mean, I know of course, right? It is human nature to want a good, clean, easy answer for there is goodness in humanity and therefore we can put goodness in charge Etc. Etc. It's kind of like a like a um, false hope of the of the fantasy yes. genre where you're just like Aragorn's <laughs> going to be a good king. He's going to lead. Yes. <laughs> He'll be great. He's, he's going to lead Gondor to to, to success <laughs> and, and, and happiness. Yes, no. it's a human insistence that there must be someone good out there. There must be hope at the end of it. Um, and I, for a while, have just been wanting to write something that explores this idea, but kind of slowly decays it, right? And so I, I just knew that when I did something adult, it needed to be a series and it needed to be something that was negotiating with the idea of power in some way that was different to, okay, we just put this person on the throne and see what happens because there were just different things about identity and power I wanted to look at. I'm really trying not to spoil a big like plot twist in Immortal Longings <laughs> right? when I talk about yeah. this, which is why I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to have such a fun time talking about this after the three books are over. <laughs> um, and after people are like writing was, comparative essays and all that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But there is a plot point that happens in Immortal Longings that explains why a main character is not who you think they are. And I started working backwards from that because I knew I wanted that plot point there in order to kind of have a thesis statement across the trilogy that power is corruption and you cannot ever really be good. You are kind of just going to want to reach for it anytime it's, you know, within view. Um, and while I was thinking about this, I was watching the Netflix show Altered Carbon, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite shows. I just I love the aesthetic. I love cyberpunk. Um, and I started thinking, I want body jumping in this book series, um, in Altered Carbon for any of It's called like Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Like the body is completely replaceable, right? But the mind is placed in a chip at the back of your neck and you you are that chip. You move around with it, but your body can get destroyed. You get a new body, et cetera, And that's et cetera. where the term Altered Carbon and comes from because it's like, you're just, you're just going from one carbon body to the next. Nobody um, cares yeah. anymore. <laughs> I was like, I'm not quite writing science fiction yet, but I want to make this a possibility in the world. 
Um, and so in, in Immortal Longings, people can jump into different bodies uh, because they are not their bodies. They are their chi, which in Chinese philosophy is actually a real thing. It's like the soul, essentially. Um, except, you know, in mine, I kind of changed it around to be like a physical manifestation as opposed to in Chinese philosophy, there's chi everywhere. But all that aside, I it I just made it so that it is that science fiction element of things are replaceable and things are maneuverable, but it became magic instead. And my favorite way of like looking at magic and fantasy is just that it's some sort of science that we don't really understand yet. Like I'm sure if the society in Immortal Longings keeps like advancing, they're going to be able to explain jumping in some way. But before they reach that point, it is my magic system. So there are rules in place and I had to make sure that there were enough rules so that it didn't get confusing for the reader. Um, but that mostly came from revision. Like the first draft of Immortal Longings was very, very confusing. It did not make sense how people were jumping, but we, we polished that up. <laughs> That's what edits are for. <laughs> exactly. It made me think of the, there's this like famous Isaac Asimov quote, which is like any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that like applies yeah. so yes. well here. I love the fact that, like um, we talked to Robert Jackson Bennett about this. That episode is coming I was out just after Chloe, that. so like, bleh, time. oh, so get ready um, for it. There, we, but yeah, because he said he's like, I wrote cyberpunk yeah, as, as fantasy. fantasy, and so it's like I right? love it because Which... you've done this with all your work. It's like you've basically used the blanket term of fantasy, but you've really um, played with the boundaries of like what genres you can sort of like permeate that space swallow with. into fantasy yeah like what you yeah. can just kind of <laughs> absorb into your stories and people will just be like oh this fantasy is why awesome romeo and juliet and then be like oh oh yeah, oh <laughs> what's this <laughs> yeah a little different nice yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I feel like that's why there is the umbrella term sff yeah. like so much of it does feel interchangeable even if there are like you know, the distinctions of what typically makes a science fiction, what typically mm -hmm. makes a fantasy. But some of my favorite ones are the ones that uh, manage to blend them together. Yeah. And I feel like at some point you'll you'll throw down some sci-fi. You know, you'll get your cyberpunk out there. Oh. <laughs> Look at that face. She's like, oh, you have no oh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, on this note, this is actually a really perfect segue. Chloe, you set us up. Um, I want to talk <laughs> about this kind of like uh duality of your career in terms of like the YA that you've written and the adult that you're starting out with the mortal longings in that mm -hmm. series. Um, I've had conversations with MJ about this where I'm like, I don't fucking know what the distinction is to be Where's honest. Where's the line? Yeah, like there's, no one knows. It's so often like contested. <laughs> it's like I read, I read YA books and I'm like, this doesn't feel like something like a, a young mm -hmm. adult would be like mm -hmm. appropriately introduced to or whatever. It's like, I see like more like, sex and spice in like YA stuff than I do in most adult fiction. And so for you, like in your mind, what makes a book YA versus adult? I love this question because <laughs> I have so many opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also, I think I come into this from an, from a very like personally informed angle because um, I only read young adult for a very long time because I was a young adult. Like from the for the beginning of my career, I just did not really have the frontal lobe for adult fiction. Like there were many times where I was reading an adult fantasy book and I could physically feel myself thinking, I'm not smart enough for this yet, which isn't to say teenagers aren't smart. Like there are many teenagers who do enjoy adult fantasy, but I think audience is that big defining factor of like who was this book actually written for when the author was thinking about their ideal reader and so often when I was younger there would be books that I would pick up and I just did not feel like I was being swept away in it in a like in a way where I now know if I pick up the book at this age I am that audience because there's something in my brain chemistry that changed for it um, so when I think about like my why in adult books, it is the worldview that I bring into it and the worldview that I assume my audience has. Um, and I think the easiest way that I've thought about it when it comes to like, say the character relationships is that a lot of the, uh, concerns that my YA characters will have is, you know, 
Will there be love for me? Will there be a future for me? What do I do next? Versus a lot of my adult characters are going through problems that it's not their coming of age anymore. It's more about working out what their world is around them. It's what if love isn't enough? What if this is not what my life should be? What if I'm wrong? What if I was never right? All of those questions that I think us as adults ask after you have finished maturing, so to speak. Um, So I always think that we argue ourselves into circles when the industry is saying, what is the age cutoff for why an adult? Or what is the content of violence, of sex, of swearing? Because I feel like those kinds of things don't necessarily define what makes something young adult an adult. Because at the end of the day, they're like, they're audience categories, right? Like, my YA books have 25 year olds and my adult books have like 21 year olds. And yet it is not quite that, that like sets it apart from me. It's the way they have developed to see their world. Um, so it's like a, you know, I don't really think it's an easy answer because that still doesn't help someone sitting there thinking, what is my book? It's kind of like, a, well, who does your book gel yeah. with? And let's go from yeah. there. Yeah, I think it does help people that are trying to figure out where to categorize mm. their book. I think that's a really, that's probably the <laughs> clearest description of the difference that I've heard anyone yeah, cause, give. Cause and it makes sense. about this a lot. <laughs> right, right. Well, because you're speaking to the problems uh, of the people reading it, right? Yeah. Whereas, mm. Uh, mm. I, I, I mean, and I, I, <laughs> I completely get what you mean when you're saying when you were trying to read <laughs> some of the adult books at a younger age and you're like, whoa, Mrs. Dalloway, I'm not Jane, gelling Mrs. with Dalloway. this. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, legit, <laughs> yeah. right. But uh, yeah. actually let's use Mrs. Dalloway as an example. I think that it's, yes, <laughs> some of it was also that 16 year old me was not uh, smart enough to handle that. But I think some of it too, was that I could not relate to Miss Dalloway's problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause you're because not a middle-aged woman are... in Britain after world war one. <laughs> Right. <laughs> not even like World War One, right? But like, I'm I'm not a middle aged woman with middle aged uh, bored housewife problems, right? Like, that's not yeah. my story. No, I'm just exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got I got several yeah. years before middle age, right there, Adrian. Oh, <laughs> but like, yeah. you know what I mean? I think it is about, um, yeah, speaking to the problems and like what you're. Yeah. What audience it speaks to? I think that's a great. Yeah, because yeah. too often, yeah. too exactly. often, it's like trapped in this sort of bubble of like marketing terminology and like yeah, like you're saying your characters age, are 14 to 16 yeah, yeah, then. like age groups mm-hmm. and, and like certain content things like mj's yeah. mj's book gets mistaken as YA all the time it gets put on YA yeah. lists all the time which i don't i don't mind yeah. I, th- I mean if, if it's like young, i don't think there's any audiences that's are like, reading and liking it dope <laughs> i don't know if there's anyone like under 19 in your book Maybe Tristan. Yeah, there's not. No, there's not. not Tristan. Oh, yeah, Tristan is. Tristan's 17, yeah. but still, like, it doesn't really matter because, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's because it's become such a marketing thing these Buzzword, days where whatever. it's like, yeah. yeah, like you see a woman writing science fiction fantasy and they're like, okay, that's definitely YA. And it's yep. like, well, that's not quite how <laughs> yeah. it works, actually. And it's like, that's the YA like category only became big in the first place because people started realizing oh, a lot of teenagers are buying this. Like when you actually write for teenagers, they're really enthusiastic and they want to read these books and they kind of, you know, revitalize the publishing industry. And now we're kind of moving at a time where people are like, Oh, YA is marketable. Let's put everything in YA. Yeah. That's like, actually no, you missed the point of why it was that's, good. That's what I was talking about <laughs> earlier. It's like the sort of dinosaur nature of the publishing industry and how like, when you chase trends, mm-hmm. this is like the tail end of how that um, that trend chasing sort of peters out and becomes mm-hmm. almost unsustainable in what the publishers have in terms of expectations. But also readers might be feeling like burnout or they might feel like this isn't actually speaking to me. Like you don't know, you don't understand what you're trying to market at me. It's- and it's like it doesn't click. So it's like you might be mismarketing exactly. If that's even a word, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. misappropriately marketing something to a teenager when it's like, no, they don't want to read that shit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what are your summer, what have been some of your favorite parts about writing YA? And then what have been some of your favorite parts about changing into the adult or sort of like shifting into the adult Exploring fiction space? Exploring the adult market. Yeah. And yeah. Like mm-hmm. sort of challenging what you'd experienced beforehand. 
I think my favorite part of YA is the the emotions because I think something that makes YA so strong is the fact that a lot of those experiences you're writing about like no matter if it's a contemporary coming of age or like someone in a fantasy world literally saving the world it is still the first time they've lived a lot of their life which means when anything happens it feels so intense it feels so serious because you don't have anything to judge it against um and I think about how when you are a teenager, like if one thing goes wrong or if you have one embarrassing moment, it is literally the end of the world. And I think leaning into that in fiction is one, a lot of fun and two, very like cathartic to be able to live that kind of like different life when you are just like some suburban teenager, right? Like that was why, that was why I love reading YA because I felt like my high school life was so boring and I would finish my day of like classes and I would go home and then I would read about like an ordinary girl from West Virginia falling in love with an alien. Like it was just, (laughs) there was something so like beautiful about that. Um, And in writing YA, I get to be able to create like those experiences for like other teenagers reading it who do like they're they're seeking either escapism or like some sort of world to like fully sink into and i think the extremes of the emotions is what makes why i have that like extra um you know emotional element that a lot of adult it's not that they can't do it it's that they're not as interested in doing it which is both a pro and a con like you know depending on what it is that your audience is looking for um which is why I think, you know, phasing into adult now is something that I was only able to do when I became an adult. Like a lot of times people are like, what inspired like immortal longings? And I'm like, well, probably mid 20s. <laughs> my frontal lobe, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. General sense of disenchantment with the yeah. world yeah. that we all get. Yeah. <laughs> As MJ yeah. likes to say, just a general feeling of ennui. The general mm-hmm. feeling of ennui. <laughs> that really is exactly it. Because I feel like that's not really interesting when you're a teenager. Like you have a lot of other things to worry about. Like, what are you going to? Where are you going to go to yeah. go for college? What are Fucking you going to major? Like those things. Queen, you bitch, and just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why aren't I the homecoming queen? <laughs> they're, they're like they're, they're such immediate problems, and then you kind of think of like adult fiction, and it's. A general sense of ennui that's exactly it um so i have actually liked getting to write that broader feeling um i think the more i this is a deranged sentence to say the more i grow into adulthood the more i really get it you know and i'm like i would like to write this fiction for other people struggling with adulthood um that's why i feel like my even my adult fiction is very like new adult i know that's a dead category now but if it was still around it would bring it back i know it needs to be around because honestly i mean like now i'm old and in my 30s but like when i (laughs) was in my i mean even now i feel like i have no idea what's going on with life but like when i was in (laughs) my 20s like 22 to 27 right like that area that's Mm -hmm. actually like young adult like in reality i was like i feel like there needs to be more (laughs) fiction for this age range of people that are in this Mm -hmm. Second massive mm-hmm. shift in their lives. So yeah, I'm all for bring back new adult as a category. Don't have fiction. it have we to be it. spicy because exactly. that's like one of the things that people said has to be a new adult. Which I'm like, it can be great, but that's not like the whole new adult experience. It's not the, point. Like, not the yeah. whole theme. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, winding down a little bit. Uh, what? does the future hold for you? Uh, can you tell us about what you're working on next or give us some little hints about what's coming up for Chloe Gong? Um, well, I'm currently working on the sequel to Immortal Longings. Um, hopefully there will be information about that soon. But publishing as publishing normally is kind of just does what it wants when it comes to <laughs> announcements. So, you know, it's coming out sometime this year. Don't ask me when. I don't know either. Um, so I am currently revising that and making it, you know, more toxic than ever in classic <laughs> Anthony Cleopatra fashion. I'm Amazing. really excited about it. Um, and in the YA sphere, hopefully I will have more news about what I have coming next. Um, 
I I think I can say this. It, it's I'm working on something very different to what I have published thus far because I have published only historical and YA so far, and this is futuristic. So it is very very different. Um, but it's something that I've been wanting to do for a very long time, and hopefully there will be news soon. So people. Please keep your eyes peeled. Can I say when? No, I can't. As normal. <laughs> Just keep your eyes peeled indefinitely. Yeah. Because indefinitely. The publishing yeah. does what yeah, it wants. Dry eye, deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> Get the visine going. Keep them open. <laughs> all day, baby. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Chloe, to close out, I have two requests. If you could give listeners and viewers, A, a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and B, tell us a weird or random fact Ooh. that you find to be utterly fascinating. Oh, wow. Okay. Random sound by writing advice. Um, think of writing as having little treats. And by that, I mean, think about that viral meme picture of someone who was reading a textbook and placed a jelly bean on each paragraph. In order to motivate yourself to write, find those metaphorical jelly beans for every chapter because that way you are keeping yourself excited to finish that chapter and a reader is also going to be excited if they can feel that you are excited. The worst thing is when you're writing something and it feels like it's pulling teeth, right? So find your jelly beans and write your book. That wasn't very soundbitey, but I hope there was That was very soundbitey. Find your jelly beans and write your book. I love that. They may be real jelly beans or they may be something else entirely. She said that she uh, she treats herself with cookies. Yes, right? Wow. Okay, and random fun fact. Oh, I should have prepared this. Um, My favorite random fun fact is – I don't think this is – Like, I think most people know this, but I really like that um, octopi have beaks. It just doesn't (laughs) seem like they should have beaks. But anytime I'm, like, coming up with absurd things for, like, a fantasy book, I'm like, you know what? If a real octopus can have a beak, you can justify anything as long (laughs) as you justify it. I, I like love that. that. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, like I, I'll get like an octopus from like the seafood market and stuff. Got to take that beak out, you know? Wait, like for real? Yeah. It's like a, it's like a hard, it's like a hard thing. No, I, mean, I know they have beaks, but I, I, well, I've never. I'm sorry, I've never bought a whole octopus before. I don't so buy, this is just a it's new. It's not like like a experience Pacific for me. Pacific opt- octopus that's like the size of me, well, but it's I, like. <laughs> Not, I mean, it's a thing that people do yeah. in Detroit, like because it's uh, for the Red Wings, like our hockey team. It's like a thing to throw an octopus on the you're ice. All weird. But yeah. it's a really. I mean, I know, I know. Why, that, is that, is a, that is a random yeah. fucking fact right there. That is a yeah. random fact right there related to octopi. But yeah, I personally have never bought. Okay, one. I'm not. Go get yourself an octopi. <laughs> cut that shit open. Oh, take that octopus. beak out. Look at it. Play yep. around. Squeeze yeah, the squeeze beak. the beak, man. Squeeze it's sharp. Like it's very pointy. You can like cut yourself on it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Sounds dangerous. Octopi. <laughs> Chloe, thank you so much for chatting with MJ and I today. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast um, and, mm. and just getting to pick your brain a little bit. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Um, can you let everyone know where they can find you online? Mm-hmm. I am at the Chloe Gong on Instagram, TikTok various other social platforms i'm the same username and i'm at oh no i'm www.thechloegong.com for my website the chloe gong and go get yourself chloe gong. it's because chloe gong was taken it, it someone else took it first so not, I'm <laughs> no 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 no, no. it's because you are the, the chloe yeah. gong yeah you just own gong. that i love that <laughs> like, <laughs> a, like a spite a spite buy i'm just gonna i'm just gonna mm-hmm. buy this website domain in spite of you Yep. <laughs> awesome. Uh, you can follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, everything at SFF Addicts Pod. You can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across every, all of them, all the socials <laughs> at MJ Coon Books, all one word, or MJCoon.com. And go buy these babies. And if you want some free stuff, you can sign up for MJ's newsletter. Go buy these babies to feed this baby. Yeah. 
Also, I did a reading of, <laughs> of MJ's <laughs> newsletter story, Sham Wizard of Golden Dawn, in a Scottish accent, just having some fun and shit. It sounds and super dope. <laughs> go, go, go subscribe to our Patreon and, and hear that, or at least yeah, hear Yeah, you can check yeah, it yeah. out. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Chloe for our mini masterclass on writing romance. We're going to get spicy up in here. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.